Today I'm going to show you how to make this adventure game, where you have some health, where there are some spikes and moving hazards that can damage you, as well as doors you can unlock by picking up some keys. This is just a template, but if you add your own art, some story elements, and more rooms, this is enough to become a fully fledged game, albeit a small one. First things first, is I will be going through a good amount of code in this tutorial using PulpScript, and so I highly recommend watching this video first about the basics of PulpScript, since I'll be assuming you'll have an understanding of what I went over. With that out of the way, let's get right into it. The first thing that we'll make is a gate that requires a key, since that offers up some progression to the game. Let's make some custom world tiles for the walls. You can delete all this stuff and create your own little room. Then, I'm going to make a sprite that represents the gate. As a reminder, a sprite is a special tile you can interact with but doesn't let you walk through it. Let's also create a key item. And again, as a refresher, an item is a special tile that you can walk over to pick up. Now, I'm going to attach a script to the lock gate. We can respond to the interact event, which gets called whenever the player bumps into the sprite. We can then write a small conditional, which checks the variable keys to see if the player has any keys. In here, we can subtract one from the keys, since the player should use up a key to open the door. Then, we can effectively open the gate by just deleting it, which we can do by swapping with white, which is just the default empty background tile. The reason this works is because how pulp items are set up. The default behavior is that whatever the item's name is, you can add an S to the end of the name, and pulp will automatically increment a variable with that name. If the player doesn't have any keys, a good practice is to have some feedback. So we can add an else statement and create a dialog by calling the say function. So let's try this out in game. You can use control B or command B as a shortcut for running the game. We can see that if we have no keys, we can't open the gate, but as soon as we pick up a key, we can open the gate. Currently, we have no clue how many keys we have. Let's create a little UI element to indicate the number of keys. Let's do a world tile, and then I can check this to make sure you can't walk past it. I'm gonna go into the the player script and respond to the draw event. I want to draw to the top right of the screen, and as a reminder, the coordinates go from 00, 0 in the top left down to 2414 in the bottom right. We can use the special function tell to tell a specific tile to do something. We can tell the tile at location 230 to become the key icon and the next tile to be black. We can then write the keys variable directly to the screen using the label function. Now, if we run the game, we can see that it shows the keys in the top right of the screen. If you pick up a key, it automatically updates to show that. And when you use a key, it updates as well. Next step is to create a health system. Responding to the load event, we can create a max health variable, and then also a health variable that gets set to max health at the beginning of the game. Now, obviously we need some way to display this, and we could just do a label that shows a number, but that's a bit boring. So let's make a Zelda-like heart display. We want to first make some heart sprites for the full heart, a half heart, and an empty heart. Now, bear with me for this next part. It's actually a tiny bit complicated to draw the hearts, but I'll walk you through my implementation of this. What we want to use is a loop, which is essentially a special function that allows us to repeatedly call a piece of code until a certain condition is met. Our condition is that we want to draw the number of hearts equal to half of the max health, since each heart is two health. So with 10 health, we should be drawing five hearts. Let's keep track of the number of hearts we're drawing with a variable called heart count. Then we can create a while loop that checks if heart count is less than max health. At the bottom of the loop, we can increment heart count by two. So as an example of what's gonna happen, we're gonna start at the top of the loop, heart count is going to be zero. Then we'll add two to heart count. And since two is less than 10, we'll keep going. And then it'll go to four, six, eight, and then finally 10. And since 10 is not less than 10, it's exactly equal to it, we'll exit the loop. If you counted, that's exactly five times that we went through the loop. To start this simple, let's begin by just drawing empty hearts. I'll keep track of the name of the empty heart tile in this variable, sprite to swap. We then want to draw this sprite to the top left of the screen. We want to draw the hearts at x equal to 0, 1, 2, and so on. We can easily calculate this by dividing heart count by 2, but since we don't want to affect the heart count, we can store it into a new variable and divide that by 2. Then we can tell heart draw x and y equals 0 to swap to sprite to swap. Let's change the y value to a variable as well. If we run it, we can see that it does indeed draw five empty hearts. And if we change max health to 12, it draws six. If we change it to 11, it also draws six, which is correct since the last heart is needed to draw half a heart. Next, let's start filling in the health. 
We can check if the health is greater than heart count, and then we can set sprite to swap to the full heart. An example to show what this is doing is imagine if your health is at 2, so exactly one heart should be filled in. When this loop is drawing the first heart, heart count is 0, so 2 is greater than 0, so it draws a full heart. However, when the loop is drawing the second heart, the heart count is 2, which is equal to 2, not greater than, so it continues drawing an empty heart. But we run into an issue for the odd health values. When health is 3, when the loop is drawing the second heart, it sees that 3 is greater than 2, so it draws a full heart, when really, it should be drawing just half a heart. One way to fix this is by noticing that the half heart only gets drawn at the very end, and when it is drawn, the health is only 1 away from the heart count. We don't actually want to change the health value, so let's store it into a new variable called health comparator. So, after checking if health comparator is greater than heart count, we can subtract 1 from health comparator and see if it is now equal to heart count. If so, we know that this is actually supposed to be a half heart, and we can set sprite to swap to reflect that. Otherwise, we draw a full heart. Now, we can see that for different health values, the hearts are drawn properly. With the health implemented, we can add some things to damage you. First, I'm going to draw some spikes when they're extended, and spikes when they're retracted. I'm going to make them items since you should be able to walk through them, but a world tile works for this as well. Now that we have these tiles, how do we get it to switch back and forth? We can leverage the loop event, which gets called every frame, which is 20 times a second. Since it's only called on the game script, let's go there. In the event variable, there's a special member called frame that gives you the number of frames that has passed since the beginning of the game. This is useful for essentially creating a timer system. Let's store this into a variable, frames elapsed. Now, we want a way to basically do something every x number of frames. Let's say we wanted to do something every second. We would need some way to calculate every time f elapsed is a multiple of 20. So, as 0 frames elapsed, 20 frames elapsed, 40 frames elapsed, and so on. Normally, you would do this with something called the modulus operator, but that doesn't exist here. Instead, what we can do is divide f elapsed by the number of frames we want to be the interval. I'll just put 10 here for now to do something every half second. And then we can write this. So what this floor function does is it takes any decimal number and it rounds it down. So here's what that looks like. When f elapsed is 0, we divide by 10, which is still 0. Then the floor of that is also 0. Now, when f elapsed is 1, we divide by 10, and f elapsed becomes 0.1. The floor, however, is still 0. Now let me continue with this and write it all out for you. If you caught on, you'll notice that f elapsed and f elapsed floor are equal at exactly every interval. We can use this property to write a condition and emit our own signal. I haven't mentioned this before, but you can actually create your own event signals. We're going to use this to tell our spikes when to switch. Before we do that, let's change this interval to a variable. This has the added benefit of allowing us to change how fast the spikes move in different rooms. Now, for the retracted spike script, which I called spike in, we can respond to the spike update event and swap to the extended spikes, which I called spike out. In spike out, we can do the same thing, but in reverse. In game, you can see that it switches. And if I change the interval, you can see the speed of the switch changing. Right now, it doesn't damage the player, so let's change that. In the spike in script, we want it to damage the player the moment the spikes come out. We can check if the player is on the spike by comparing the spike location and the player location by writing this. Event.px and event.py hold the coordinates of the player. Inside here, we could just subtract from the player's health, but I would like to propose something different. Instead, let's first create a spike damage variable in the game script. Then, in the spike script, set a variable called damage to spike damage. Then, tell the player to call a signal on themselves like so. Call is different from emit where emit sends the event signal to everyone. Call only sends the event signal to whoever is making the call. In the player script, we can respond to this event by subtracting damage from health. This might seem unnecessarily complicated right now, but it will become clear later why this is ideal. Next, when the spikes are out, it's a bit different, since you want it to damage the player whenever the player moves onto the spike, not when it changes. We can use the update event, which is called every time the player moves. One problem, however, is that update is only sent to the player. Not a problem. We can just create our own signal and emit player updated whenever the update is called. In the spike out script, we can now intercept the player updated event and again check if the player is on the spike and do the same thing. Let's just copy it from up here. Now, whenever the spike comes out, we get damage, but also when we move onto an extended spike. Stationary spikes are great but we can make a moving hazard as well. For my implementation, you're going to need four different items for the four different directions the hazards can go. I have them named accordingly, which you should do as well. Let's create another timer in the game loop so we can have different timings for the spike and spike ball, along with new variables for the different values. I'll start off with the spike ball down script. Essentially, what we want to do is whenever spike ball update is called, 
we will swap the tile below us to the spike ball and erase the current tile, which simulates movement. We can get the coordinates of the tile below by using the event variable to get the coordinates of the current tile and increment the y by 1. Let's set a variable to hold the tile we want to swap to, which is currently itself, so spike ball down. Since eventually we'll need to actually swap to the upwards moving spike ball, we can start off by deleting the current tile by swapping with white. Then we tell target x and target y to swap to the swap target. Now, this only goes in one direction, and you can see how that works in game. Small tip for developing is to write your code in chunks and continuously test as you finish parts as you can verify that it works, and it saves a bunch of headache of trying to figure out what is causing the problem. We can go back in this script and use a function called solid that returns one if a tile is a solid tile and zero otherwise. We can see our target tile is solid and store it into a variable. We can then check if that variable is equal to one. And if so, we should be bouncing off the wall. So we should be moving up instead. So it should change the swap target to spike ball up. We also need to change the Y target since it should be the tile above where it currently is and not below. And you can get that by writing this. It currently doesn't damage the player. So we can do the same check we've been doing for the regular spikes in the tail block, but use the spike ball damage instead. Again, this only damages the player when the spike moves onto you, but not when you move onto the spike. So we should respond to the player updated event to deal damage as well. We can copy this code over to the spike ball up script and change some values. First, we want to be moving up, so this should be minus equals one. And here, it should be plus equals one. If we now try this out in game, you can see that it works, and we can change the update interval to change the speed. You can also see it doing a different amount of damage. Also, if you add more walls, you can see that the ball detects where the wall is and bounces off of it automatically. We can easily make this move horizontally instead by tweaking the values to update on the x-axis. One thing to keep in mind, however, is when a horizontally moving spike and a vertically moving spike meet, one of them will get destroyed. There's a way to work around that, but it requires a lot more code. Now that the gameplay is pretty much done, let's add some polish. Let's make the game give a little bit more feedback. We can start off by adding some screen shake. This is why I recommended creating a damage function because we don't have to add this code in all the different damaging elements. We can just add it right here. And if you create any new damaging things, they will automatically have this feature. We can use a handy function called shake to give some screen shake whenever you get damaged. It takes in one argument, which is the time of the shake, which we can set to 0.1 seconds. Now, in game, every time you take damage, the screen shakes, which already feels much better. Next, I'll make some sound effects. I won't go too much into how the sound tab works, since that's not the focus of the tutorial, but it's pretty easy to put some sounds together. First, we can make a move sound when the player moves. Then, a hurt sound. Next, let's do a key pickup sound. We should have a door opening sound as well. A sound for when the spikes come out. And also another sound for when the spikes come in. Lastly, a bounce sound for the spike balls would be good too. We can start putting the sounds in, which entails calling the sound function in certain parts of the code. We can put the move sound in the update event, the hurt sound in the damage event. For the key, we actually need to switch this to a script, which is simple to do. On collect, we can increment the keys variable, play the sound, and delete the tile. For the door unlock, we can just add it in here when the door is opened. In the spike, we can play the spike out sound when it swaps to it in the spike in script, and vice versa for the spike out script. Lastly, when the spike ball swaps, we can put in the bounce sound. Let's try this out in game. When two sounds play at once, it sometimes cancels out one of them, which I'm not really sure how to fix. You can create new rooms by using the exit tiles and connecting them. You can also create an ending by using the fin exit. Also, when your health hits zero, the game should end. 
So you can do that in the player script. That should be all the things you need to start making your own game. You can build off of this by changing the art, adding story, making it look different like a space themed one, or some sort of fantasy game, or anything you can imagine. It's very extensible. You can also imagine additional items you can add, like making a health pickup to heal you by just incrementing the health, checking if you're over the max health, and playing a sound effect. I'll put the source code of the project in the description. Last thing, I have a little announcement to make. I just hit 100 subs, which is a small milestone, so I thought it would be fun to create a Discord server. Link is in the description. See you there, and see you next time.